All right, guys, welcome to another video. Today, we're going to talk about the Imperium system and matchmaking, how that actually works, what affects what. And then more importantly, at the end, I'm going to talk about some of the challenges and problems that we're currently dealing with and then my solution or my uh, change for it. Uh, this video or this topic, in my opinion, is on the minds of especially uh, end game players that are playing at a higher level. Right, I think like yesterday, I saw Chiz Gold uh, make a video talking about the Imperium system. Uh, just today, 1093, right? Probably the strongest, well, not probably, the strongest kingdom in the game. Released like a bunch of stuff about how like the Imperial Lines drop in. And essentially, it's their, um, they're advocating for Lilith to make an update. And I also know that Lilith is actively looking at that. You know, they're actually asking for player feedback. Uh, it is something they're looking for. So this is my two cents. Uh, I'm going to take you on a wild adventure for this one. Uh, we're going to cover a lot of different stuff, right? A lot of different concepts from like Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged. It's a book if you uh, never heard of it. Really good book, by the way. Talk a little bit about some uh, concepts in crypto or Bitcoin, uh, how that actually ties into this big problem set, uh, some challenges that people don't even think about. Uh, and then finally, uh, we'll end with uh, how I would actually improve the current in Imperium system uh, for Lilith. All right, so first of all, let's talk about the basics. Uh, if you look at this screenshot over here, right, you can see all these little Imperium symbols. But when you look closely, right, there's a third domain for 1960, like the second domain for 2489. Usually when people are thinking about the domain system, this is actually what they think about. What's wrong with the domain system, right? So let's actually um, get down to the nitty gritty of this because in my opinion, the domain system is mostly on the right track and there actually only needs to be a few small changes for it to actually be really, really good. Okay, so first let's, just, let's talk about the Imperium system. Okay, so uh, not the early game Imperium. Once you get into Season of Conquest, the Imperium system is designed to uh, create a competitive balance. Okay, so uh, later on you'll see I'm gonna equate it to a salary cap in sports, but it's a way to essentially limit a kingdom from getting too strong or a couple kingdoms from getting too strong where it actually kind of breaks the competitive balance of the game. So for the Imperium system, the simplified version is uh, Lilith does a scan, right? They'll take the top 300 uh, players by power or 300 accounts by power in the kingdom. And then uh, if you're above 150 mil, it'll just count as 150 mil. So if you have a bill power, it'll still count as 150 mil. And then uh, that's your quote unquote Imperium burden, okay? And then uh, if you are in the top 24, you're considered an Imperium Kingdom. Now for younger Kingdom, right? It's nice to be an Imperium because that means you're one of the stronger Kingdoms. And it's kind of like that at the end game, but when you are an Imperium Kingdom, all of a sudden it severely limits your migration. If you are an Imperium, you can actually only bring in one player by month using a, uh, what's called like a special ticket. So uh, it's actually very, very restricted, right? So you can see a lot of Kingdoms, uh, prominent Kingdoms in the last year or two years have died. Uh, or just fell apart a huge reason is because they actually can't get out of the imperium system uh, or get out of imperium burden so they can't bring in fresh blood and that player's retiring but the players actually still count towards the imperium burden and then eventually it's like a spiral downwards and they fall apart okay now with a new domain system which i'm going to go over when you think imperium now just think what it really affects is migration right so in sports, right, let's just take like the NFL or the NBA, or actually even uh, MLB, like baseball, right? All these different uh, sports, there's a draft, right? So a way to actually draft younger players. And that's for the most part, um, uh, de uh, like determined in a way where uh, teams that are more successful get a lower draft pick, right? Teams that are worse get a higher draft pick, right? So a way to create that competitive balance. And then another way to actually acquire uh, players is to sign them through free agency, right? So I'm going to go over salary cap after this because you could actually see how the salary cap will really mimic uh, uh, the Imperium system, specifically uh, a soft salary cap. And uh, the whole purpose though is there's a limit so that teams that are really successful will have a harder time uh, acquiring or, or teams that have a high payroll have a harder time acquiring more players whereas teams that are very strategic and do good, do a good job of lowering their payroll or in this case think imperium burden will actually have more space to bring in more players right so i think it's very important because usually just human nature if you don't have it and this is not just in sports you're looking like across different industries and stuff when you don't have a cap on this usually what tends to happen is you end up getting a monopoly uh 
of like when it comes to like businesses or corporations right and then when it comes to like wanting to be competitive right if there's only just one super team and no one else is competitive it'll be kind of boring usually what you'll end up is two really strong super teams that are like a cut above the rest and then everyone else is just the weak plebs that are hoping to get on one of the two super teams eventually right so i do think it's a good thing but obviously there's some uh changes that need to be made to it because uh the current imperium system was made a while ago and then the the status or like where the game is at now is not where it was at three years ago right now the domain system which is a lot newer uh besides the part where there's like a domain two which do, domain two or three which seemed to make no sense right because essentially it just farms or sometimes like people as a joke will put like rogues in there and they'll essentially end up in this kvk and uh you could have like a 1960s domain three in your camp that's essentially just a completely dead camp that doesn't do anything right now I don't know exactly the reason why Lilith made it because on the surface it seems very very dumb like why would you do this and just essentially kill your own game but uh if I had to throw out a couple possibilities uh maybe they thought people would kind of want to split up the matchmaking so uh instead of having just one super kingdom maybe you could split up your kingdom into two stronger kingdoms and then queue separately into different kvks maybe if that was the intention obviously it didn't work Another thing I think about is even though at the end game, right, it's very hard to even see like a three alliance kingdom. Uh, they're all over the place in the earlier game, right? Uh, like these younger kingdoms, a lot of them will have like three, four, maybe even five active alliances. Now, obviously, uh, when the game first starts, a lot of players are excited. And then as it goes on, more and more drop off, right? But at the early game, uh, if you let's just say you do a, um, a low uh, number for the domain let's just say you do like 600 right you, maybe you have more active players than that and then you're kind of shooting yourself in your own foot and you're actively discriminating against allowing more players into a kvk especially when they're excited about it and then from lilith's standpoint you can make more money off of them right so you don't want to do that either so i don't know the exact reason why they're doing a domain two or three but uh if you just think about the first domain right the one that actually matters for most people that's done specifically to do matchmaking, right? Because now in a lot of kingdoms, there's rogues, there's deadweight players that are maybe log in once a week uh, that have no interest in fighting, right? So uh, before the domain system, uh, and it's not official, there's like bits and pieces uh, Lilith will release, but at least as far as we could gather, they were taking the top 900 uh, uh, City Hall 25 accounts in the kingdom, right? And then we don't know how they're counting KP and a couple other factors but essentially they're taking some combination of the top 900 the power uh city hall and then uh, kp and then using that to determine matchmaking with the domain system specifically domain one now they're actually putting that in the hands of the kingdom leadership and kingdom leadership actually gets to designate the kvk roster and then the kvk roster or domain one is actually used to do the matchup uh, i think this is way better than what they were doing before uh, the obvious big drawback is right now you have domain two and domain three that's essentially dragging down like lower level KVKs or killing KVKs, right? Which I strongly think they need to change. But as far as domain one, I think uh, like 85, 90% of that is actually a really, really positive step in the right direction. Okay. But that's the basics as far as the Imperium system and then the domain system. So now let's get into some concepts. Okay. I already mentioned this before. Uh, there's a salary cap in professional sports, right? Well, at least in America. So the three big team sports in America is the NFL for, you know, American football, the NBA for basketball, and the MLB for baseball. So baseball doesn't have a cap, right? Uh, a, a team could sign as much uh, players as they want. They could have like a higher payroll. And it's not like uncommon to see like the highest paid team, uh, usually like a, the Yankees or like a team in LA or something, have like 7X the payroll of like a lower ranked team. Now, they're actually able to still maintain competitive parity because uh, the cap, when, when you don't have cap, right, someone still has to actually pay these players money, right? And at, at, at some point, if you're the owner of a baseball team and you're paying seven times the amount another team is paying, uh, sometimes you don't want to pay that much anymore. So one, like because someone has to pay the money, uh, there is a way to kind of keep that in check. But also uh, MLB or baseball actually has, you know, a draft, right? So every team will get designated like draft slots and then they could draft these teams into like their farm system 
right? So like if I had to give like a rock analogy, maybe it's like a, maybe a higher seed of kingdom will have a farm system kingdom that is theirs that they could put like younger promising players there. And then like younger promising player, they want to move up. They can actually go up to the higher seeded kingdom that they're a farm system for. They can't go anywhere else, right? Now, obviously we don't have anything like that in baseball. And I think if you do an uncap, which is actually what rock was uh, before they implemented the Imperium system, uh, I don't think it would actually be good for the balance of the game. I think it will actually kind of go towards that. You essentially get two super kingdoms uh, and then a lot of much, much weaker kingdoms just because you could essentially keep migrating and migrating in. And then, you know, you're either on uh, super kingdom one or super kingdom two, right? And that's kind of like the goal for competitive players. Uh, so I don't think that would be good. Now, what um, I think the Imperium system mimics the most is what's called a soft cap. Okay, so for the soft cap, in the NBA, you can also draft players, but also you could also sign free agents, right? So let's just say pretend the salary cap. So basically uh, for that year, how much the roster, uh, how much the salary of the players can add up to, uh, the salary cap would be 100 million, right? So if you're under 100 million, that means you could sign free agents, okay? So like if there's a, a, a player whose contract's up and they're a free agent, you're under the salary cap, you could sign them. Now you could go over the cap, right? So you could go over the cap, but once you're over the cap, you start becoming uh, very, very restricted and free agents you can sign. You can only sign players to a much lower deal. Uh, and then like you can offer them a lot less, right? So that's like a way where uh, there is like a cap or a threshold in mind, but you could go over it. It's just, you start incurring penalties where it's a lot harder. Okay, so guess what? Rock is kind of like the soft cap, right? Because you can actually go over the Imperium line and just when you go over the Imperium line, there's a, a penalty as far as the migrants you could bring in, but uh, you could actually still go over. Now, if you contrast that with the NFL, right, American football, there's a hard cap. Okay, with a hard cap, if it's 100 million, you can only go up to 100 million. You literally can't go over, okay? Now, for me, I think Rock made the right choice in going with a soft cap because by the nature of this game, uh, I think it's important that when you have such a big range of like spend that can actually all play together and for the most part be pretty competitive. Uh, if you take away the soft cap where players can go over, then you're essentially killing like the super Krakens, right? Like super Krakens are now going to go away. And then, uh, and then also you're taking away uh, different combinations or different ways that you could build a kingdom. Uh, if you look at the NFL, right? Like people don't form super teams in the NFL just because there's a hard cap. Uh, it's about the same model every time. Uh, the hard cap from the NFL, uh, draft picks are a lot more valuable. And right, and draft picks, basically, you have the rights to draft at this order for players coming out of college or overseas. And uh, they rely heavily upon one being smart with taking advantage of the rookie contracts. So when a younger player first comes in the league, their first contract are usually paying a lot lower and that's how they kind of quote unquote game the system. And then uh, as players are actually still really good, but now they're demanding a higher contract, uh, they tend to want to let them go to another team. And so they can replace them with a younger player with a much more cap friendly contract. Okay, so I think with the NFL, uh, you will get a lot more parity, right? Because there's less combinations you could play with, but also because there's no draft pick system and rock, uh, going with a hard cap, uh, I think actually takes away from some of the dynamic qualities of the game and doesn't make it as fun as far as all the options you have to build in the kingdom. So I do think Ro uh, Rock, Rise of Kingdoms actually made the right choice in going with the soft cap formula. There's an Imperium line, you could go over it, there's a penalty, but you could still go over it and be creative and, and, and we'll kind of ride that line how you want to build a kingdom, okay? The next concept that I want to talk about uh, is actually a quote from Atlas Shrugged, right? One of the uh, books I showed earlier. Uh, a book by Ayn Rand and in there, well, without describing it, the whole idea of check your premise is a lot of times you actually want to see what is the uh, perspective or the starting position that you're coming from, right? Because a lot of times maybe the starting perspective is completely outdated. So uh, I think I'm sure a lot of you guys have heard of this, like, I don't know if it's an urban legend or myth or if that, it's actually a real thing, right? But uh, the whole idea is like, uh, when it comes to making chicken, it's very, very common to cut the chicken in half, right? And when you ask a lot of people why they're cutting the chicken in half, they just go, no, that's just the way my mom or my grandma did it, right? And then the story is that uh, someone actually went and uh, asked like the grandma, 
like, hey, why did you cut the chicken in half? Like, where did that come from? Right. And it wasn't actually because it's to make the food taste better. It's just back then the oven was a lot smaller. So if they cut it in half, they could actually fit it in there. Right. So if you're still kind of continuing a tradition or something that's been going on now, uh, is the oven still actually really small where you need to cut it in half? If you don't, maybe a lot of these uh, uh, like things that we do, you can actually change it fundamentally to make it work a lot better now. Right. So if you think about rock, when was the Imperium system implemented? Uh, is that environment still appropriate to where we're at now? And it's not, right? The game, uh, the kingdoms are not as big. Uh, why do you still need an Imperium system that was catered towards uh, where the game was at like two or three years ago, whenever the, the system was actually implemented? The other ones to think about it from multiple perspectives, right? So like, for example, one of the most annoying things for most people and kingdom leadership is having a rogue, right? Why would Lilith actually allow rogues to, uh, to just, devastate a kingdom by themselves right like a, like you can have a free-to-play rogue that's just very very annoying they're stealing mges they're killing farms they could essentially render the whole outer zone of the home kingdom useless and like why would lilith actually allow that power because if you think about it from a different perspective right what if uh you allow people to just expel other people from the kingdom one can that actually be exploited so uh let's just say i want to exploit the migration system. So if you if someone gets expelled from the kingdom, do they get a free migration, right? Would that actually start becoming being used as an exploit? Two, uh, what if a kingdom isn't as settled and then uh, you have someone that with the king title could just start uh, ex exiling a bunch of people and kicking them out of the kingdom? Uh, or let's say it's like a more dead kingdom and someone got the title of king, they just wanna get rid of all the competition to get MGE, right? Like. At an Imperium level, like we don't think about that. Like that's not even on our radar, right? We're just thinking about how do you help the kingdom run better, smoother, so the people there can actually have a better time to go into KVK to work together. But there's actually a lot of other scenarios from the kingdoms that uh, may be allowing the ability to just kick someone out of the kingdom uh, wouldn't work so well, right? So uh, a quick story, um, I've owned a gym for 11 years now, and then before, right, I was actually a coach at a gym. I remember at the time, I used to always think, like, why did the owner do something like this or do something like that? Uh, they should have so much money left over. Like, why are they doing so, like, like, mediocre financially, right? And then once I actually became an owner, I started realizing there was all these, like, hidden overhead costs that I never thought about. And then if you make a decision here, uh, then they all actually have unintended consequences somewhere else. And there's always like repercussions. And then once you start implementing a system, uh, you have to actually be willing to see it all the way through. And a lot of times these systems that you implement will require a lot, a lot of work. And you're already having a hard time kind of just like keeping the status quo as is. Implementing a new system like that could actually be really stressful, right? But from a coach, I'm just like, no, why don't you just do this? But like, I also didn't have the responsibility for having to keep the system going. So the whole point is, Sometimes with these systems, if there's an obvious solution and someone's not doing it, it's easy to just think they're incompetent or dumb or whatever. But usually you probably want to check your premise. There's probably stuff that you don't even realize that goes into the picture. And the whole point I'm presenting this idea is because I can suggest these changes or you can suggest these changes, but there are literally factors that at least just be open to that you don't know about that's going on at Lilith, right? Also. It is a company that's responsible for making money, right? They probably have shareholders. And also like, it's a company that's supposed to make money. Uh, where is the actual money, right? Because if the money is at the early game and not at the high Imperium level, uh, then maybe the way they're doing it now is more early game friendly. And then at the Imperium level, um, it's not as important. I, I don't know, I'm, I'm just like spitballing or throwing that out there. Uh, if you actually look at uh, this picture over here <laughs> with Larry Kuhn, Right, CBA stands for a collective bargaining agreement, right? Usually uh, that's essentially what the players and the owners agree to as far as like a contract for the salary cap or how to run a league. Uh, nowadays, these things are so complicated that most teams actually will employ a uh, consultant to be a CBA expert, right? To actually help them navigate. It's almost like a, I don't know if it's exactly a lawyer, but someone that actually helps them navigate all the complex little nuances of running uh uh, a team as far as with a salary cap, right? So it can get really, really complicated. And for Lilith to be doing something like a soft cap uh, in the game, uh, it's, it's just a lot more complex than I think most people realize. And uh, if professional teams are actually hiring people to be consultants to help do that, uh, 
you know, like one, like cut them some slack, but two, just understand there's probably a lot of little things that you don't think about, right? You're just thinking about it from your perspective. Right? And then finally for me, before I got to Imperium Kingdom, I'm like, good, the Imperium line's awesome, right? It literally uh, prevents these like assholes who have a way bigger advantage than me because they started a lot earlier from getting way too strong. And a lot, it gives us like younger kingdoms a chance to catch up. And then once I'm at a higher kingdom that's Imperium, now I realize like all the annoying things and the struggles and how like a lot of the Imperium uh, uh, system and the rules are actually almost kind of like killing a kingdom, right? So also the perspective you start from uh, changes. All right, next one, let's talk about the idea of beta testing, stress test, and hackathon, okay? So it's very common, right? When a game comes out before it's officially released, there's beta testing. For me, I always just thought, okay, you have a beta test because you wanna find all the bugs, right? And that's true, you do wanna find all the bugs, right? But also, uh, if you take this more into the crypto realm, and not just crypto, there's other realms too, right? A lot of times, instead of calling it beta testing, they'll call it a stress test. Stress test is now, instead of just like having like five people running through the different programs to make sure it works. What happens when you really stress it? Like what, what if it happens when you have 10,000 people use it at once? Can it actually handle a lot more volume and still work the way it's supposed to, right? Obviously you still wanna find the bugs, but a lot of it is more, okay, here's the dynamic that we think is gonna happen. When you actually have people, right? Real life people and a lot of them try to like use this, um, can they, uh, does it actually hold up, right? So a hackathon is the same thing in the crypto world, right? When you do a hackathon, literally the developers of a crypto uh, network will pay people to try to break their system, to try to find exploits and try to find little things where uh, they could take advantage of it, right? And if they find it, you actually get a price. Now, if you think about the game, right? Rock Rise of Kingdoms, any system you implement uh, there could be the potential where it could break the game or it could create uh, some unintended consequences or uh, even allow people to exploit some things. Okay, so, uh, and, that's, and that's, that's a good thing, right? You actually want to do these stress tests or hackathons so you get that, get that uh, cleaned up first so then when you introduce the final product, people aren't able to exploit it. Uh, so right now, right, I kind of talked about it a little bit before, right? If you allow you someone to banish rogues, will that actually become an exploit to uh, get a free migration, right? Or will it be really, really easy to just use that to uh, coordinate a migration somewhere else and then make it very easy for very high level players to migrate out? Like, I don't know, right? It, but like essentially everything you implement, you also have to figure out the unintended consequences and the potential exploitation of it, right? The next is the whole idea of implementation. So let's just say you actually tested it and everything checks out, it works really, really well. But if you have a current system, right, how do you transition from the current system to the new system that you wanna implement, right? Because if it's too far apart, uh, that, trans, uh, that, uh, uh, that, that transition from the old system to the new system can actually cause the game to just break, right? Or to actually cause the game to fall apart. So ideally when you're implementing, it's something already kind of along the path, but then you clean it up, even though there could be a better idea. Uh, if you actually start out with a good good uh, uh, strategy to go about solving the problem you're solving, then when you make these implementations that's along the same path, it'll be a lot easier, right? But if the, if the idea you start off is way wrong, even if you wanna do a hard pivot later on, the implementation is gonna be a lot harder, right? So that's also part of the reason why maybe Lilith is taking longer and they're trying to weigh all these options, just because implementation is a, a huge thing. Right now, I talked about exploitation earlier, right? To me, right, if you think about what is the big difference between exploitation, which feels kind of dirty or wrong, or like, you know, someone that's just like gaming the system and cheating, and then like good strategy, right? When like someone finds this, this loophole and you're like, man, that's a really smart way to go about it. That's very strategic. And I think like the difference between the two is actually already how high the quality of the system is, right? So if I'm functioning within like a very high quality system, and then I find a good strategy to essentially maximize the value within that system with the rules, then that's great. But if you roll out a crappy system and then I just find this cheap little exploit to take advantage of over and over and over, anyone else could do that, then that becomes like kind of dirty, right? So the whole idea is that uh, I actually would prefer Lilith to take some time and then really test all these stuff out so that when they roll out the system, it's a high quality system. Cause then within the system or the rule, if you find 
good strategies to get a leg up, that's really, really awesome. But if it's like a crappy system that you could just exploit, then the game could actually be dying, right? Which I don't think it is right now. Finally, let's just talk a little bit about the idea of the Bitcoin trilemma, right? So if you're not familiar with Bitcoin, um, essentially it's uh, an idea on how to do money, right? And uh, uh, it's called crypto because it's short for cryptography and it's talking about the way to secure uh, information on the back end so that you can manipulate it. And then uh, from like a block to block to block, uh, that's very secure, right? That's why it's called blockchain. So the Bitcoin trilemma is basically uh, uh, decentralization, right? So basically you don't consolidate power with one person or a few people. Uh, decentral uh, decentralization, uh, scalability, right? So the ability to actually go, f instead of just work with a hundred people, maybe go up to millions of people. And then uh, the third one I wanna say is uh, security. Right? I think it's security, scalability, and decentralization. And security is just obvious, right? Like, is it actually sound? Can, can you hack it? Right? So one, you don't want to be able to consolidate power. You don't want, you don't want it to be easy to just hack into this thing and just, you know, start manipulating it. And the third one, uh, you want to actually be able to scale. For the longest time, uh, and the reason why I'm using this is because it was thought that you can only actually get two out of the three legs, right? It's actually hard to, comp to accommodate all three. And I think, what Lilith is dealing with right now when it comes to the Imperium system is they kind of have like a Bitcoin trilemma thing going on, right? Like you have, they have to figure out what the game's going to be about. Uh, because, uh, if you're going to be about, uh, really cleaning up the KBK and the Imperium system, right? Then the game is going to be catered towards PVP and competitiveness, but there's actually quite a bit of people that play this game that just play for the community and play to build their account but they actually don't like the part where they really have to be competitive, engage and fight and do all of that, right? So if you wanna to cater towards people that don't wanna be competitive, then the people that actually really enjoy the PVP is gonna suffer. And I think that's kind of, uh, the that's kind of the uh, gray area that Lilith is in right now, which why some of these systems, like from my perspective, it could be better if you haven't figured it out. I'm in fully in the being competitive and PVP camp. I think they don't want to alienate some of the non-competitive players and that's something they want to figure out and then my solution i think actually has to kind of address that as well all right so first let's actually talk about how we will update the system right so what are the fundamental building blocks of this game right i think the first one everyone falls under right which is building your account right? if you don't enjoy building your account right acquiring stuff leveling stuff up you probably will want to go play some other games that doesn't require that right the second one I think most people also fall under is community, right? Uh, part of what makes this game fun is, okay, you build up your account. How does it compare to someone else's account, right? Even if you don't want to fight them, right? You still, there's still like this cool thing where, okay, like how many max commanders do you have? How do you do in Canyon, right? Like you can even do like PVE elements of it where like, like being able to interact with other people, being in the same kingdom, being able to joke around, being in the same alliance is very important. So those two parts, you know, if you want to con consider this part of the trilemma, those two, I think we have a, a lot of agreement on. I think where the challenge is for Lilith, and I covered it in the last page, is that they're kind of in this no man's land right now where they're trying to cater a little bit to the competitive people, trying to cater to the non-competitive people, and it's kind of taken away from both, right? So for example, uh, can people actually be excluded from joining KBK if they're a deadweight? right? There's non-competitive people that want to go into KBK to get rewards. But if you allow non-competitive people to just go in, then it actually takes away from the real matchmaking uh, and the competitive or the PvP aspect of uh, kingdoms that want to get in. There's actually very competitive kingdoms that have dead ways from before where people that just like kind of go rogue and just want to sit around. How do you kind of resolve uh, the difference between those two? I think that's probably where uh, Lilith's biggest challenges when it comes to the Imperium system. Okay. Now also there's some, uh, limitations to my perspective or, uh, yeah, I'll call it limitations, right? So first what I prefer in my perspective is I prefer competitive KBKs. And then from the perspective of a, a, a mid or higher spender and then at a, a end game, higher level, right? So what I care about is Imperium KBKs. 
if it's like CC versus CC, uh, a lot of the stuff I am bringing up doesn't really even matter, right? I remember uh, talked about earlier how when I was a younger player in like a, a, a very new kingdom, I thought the Imperial system was great because it's actually just crippling the older kingdoms, right? So, so this is my perspective. It's a competitive PvP Imperium level end game, okay? Uh, limitation number two, I don't know what makes money, right? I don't know what, uh, where their money maker is. I don't know what they could cut out and not cut out, right? So with the solution I'm presenting, it could literally be cutting off one of the biggest money makers. And if it's doing that, they're just not gonna implement it because it could be better for the PVP players, but overall for the uh, uh, bottom line for the company, it might not be helping them, right? And then third, as I talked about earlier, I'm just some guy that's making YouTubes. I have no way to stress test this or uh, test the implementation. So I don't know what it's like, right? Like it actually takes a lot to run through the beta testing, do the hackathon, do the stress test and then implement it. I know they're doing it there. I don't know what the data is like from the stuff that they're kind of implementing, right? They already kind of implemented the domain system, then took it away and then brought it back. I don't know what they found from there. So a lot of this is from the outside looking in and I've learned enough now that uh, the sun, the we call them Monday morning quarterbacks, right? Cause you play NFL football games on the Sunday. Like the fans, I just like to say, why doesn't this team do this and this, where they think they know better than the coaches or the GMs or the people that are professionals running the teams. Almost all the time, they don't. They have no idea what the full picture is. They're just giving their perspectives from a very limited outside perspective, okay? So I don't know. I'm, I'm like fully acknowledging that. Now, having said all of this, here's the two solutions I would actually present to updating the Imperium system, okay? So the first one, top end kingdoms are dying, right? Uh, I was not gonna name any names, but maybe I'll name some, right? Like even like a year ago, some of the top kingdoms that like we all knew at the time, like 1v was really good, right? Maybe a little bit before that, like 1307 uh, was really, really good. Um, like even more recently, kingdoms like, like 1365, 2489, 1846, right? Like strong, strong Imperium kingdoms are like dramatically downsizing. Right. And to be honest, some of them, maybe after a few more KVKs will just die. And some of them probably will maybe reload and then come back stronger. I don't know. But the whole idea is kingdoms are dying. And I think the biggest problem is that there is no clear path to recovery. Right. So basically once you're kind of in that funk, when that hole, right, 1254 died, uh, they just got too big. Like they were so far into the Imperium line, they have no way of ever, ever getting out of it. Right. I think it's very important that even if a team messes up, Right, so I presented the salary cap system earlier, right? Even if you mess up in the way you're building a roster, eventually the contract expires. And when the contract expires, you're off the hook of the contract, right? Like, like you don't have to actually stay, like be bound to that contract for the entire life of your team or your kingdom. Whereas in this game right now, there's actually no way to kind of drop that, right? So I know they have this thing where like the, uh, the account could go in the cloud if it doesn't log in for 30 days. But there was like in 2268, there's literally like players from KVK2 or KVK3 that log in once a week and farm and they just keep their bubble up and where they've been zero over and over and over again, but they're still at 55 million power because they're T5 and there's just no way to actually get rid of that, right? So it's almost like this like dead weight contract that you're burdened with for life that you can't get rid of. And it's fine, right, if they want to play the game, but they're actually being counted towards the Imperium burden, which limits the kingdom's ability to bring in new players and then it starts that vicious cycle, right? So I think it's important to have a clear path to be able to recover, right? You don't, now you don't wanna make it so easy where, oh, we messed up, let me just kick out all these players and then uh, we could just start over again, right? You could actually make it layered where maybe you could get rid of X amount of power a season, but you have to give kingdoms a, a way to do that or else the kingdom's just gonna fall apart because when you accumulate too many dead weights that won't leave or, uh, yeah, that won't leave or you have too many rogues that are just doing whatever they want, eventually that kingdom's gonna die, right? And uh, that's happening to a lot of kingdoms. So my solution for this is that you actually do a non-Imperium burden roster that the king can designate, right? So basically you've had dead weight or rogues. Uh, when the migration window is open for the kingdom, uh, you can't add anyone onto that roster. But when the migration window is closed, then you can actually add dead weights or rogues onto that roster. And what that does is players on that roster, since we already have like a KVK roster, like the domain system, players on that non-Imperium Burden roster just don't count towards your Imperium Burden, right? Because then they're obviously not going to participate in KVK, but they probably shouldn't also be impacting your ability to bring in players 
to actually play in KBKs. Now, this is kind of controversial, but I think players on that roster shouldn't be able to win MGEs, right? Because for kingdoms that actually really care about MGEs, like really care about it, where they have it fixed and everything that's organized, they're doing it because it will allow them to perform better during KBKs. Whereas right now, a rogue could literally wreck a kingdom's ability to be competitive in KBKs by stealing MGEs over and over, right? I think uh, there should be a cap. So every off season, right? So basically when migration window isn't open, uh, you can only add X amount of power to that non-Imperium Burden roster. So basically, yes, you could start dropping your Imperium Burden, but you can't do it really, really fast where you could game the system, right? If you limit it to say um, 1 billion power off season, right? Over three off season, you could drop 3 billion power dead weight, which is huge for a lot of kingdoms, but it's not so fast where you can actually cheat the system. Uh, I already went over, I think it should be locked when migration is open. So uh, again, you can't like kind of drop someone off and add them on, drop someone off, add them on. I think you should be able to actually take people off the list right you should be able to take people uh off the list but you can't actually add them onto the non-imperial burden roster when the migration window is open and then finally i do think uh that you should set some kind of a minimum threshold where uh uh this applies so if you have like a really dead kingdom and everyone like you just got a bunch of rows or a bunch of casual players there that are just trying to steal mges this probably doesn't need to apply right i don't know i'll let little figures out but this probably shouldn't be affecting non-competitive kingdoms or kingdoms that really have no aspirations in KBK. But if it's any kingdom that has aspirations, whether it's an a, uh, uh, Imperium all the way down to a D seed, uh, then this should be there, right? And there's an easy way to figure that out, right? One, do they actually set, for example, a um, KBK roster, but also you could do say like a minimum power or a kill point requirement for this uh, non-Imperium burden roster to actually have to take hold. And I'm just spitballing it off the top of my head, but there's a way to make it where it's not really uh, affecting like dead kingdoms or more wild west kingdoms where like, you know, everyone's like, you have people just stealing MGEs and they're not really interested in KVK, fine, let them go do that there. But for more organized kingdoms, I think this will actually be a really, really good change. Because even if a kingdom, uh, for example, like right now, uh, the last scan I saw, like 1365 is way over the Imperium burden, right? Like without something like this, I don't know they'll ever actually be able to drop out of Imperium without killing the kingdom. And it's a story kingdom. Most end game players heard of JST. It would be a real shame for that kingdom to die and that like legendary alliance to die or well-known alliance to die just because of the current uh, way the Imperium set up. So this is how I would actually solve that problem. Uh, the other one, not as pressing in my opinion one because uh you have the uh if you make the first change right this one won't be as oppressing but also uh because of the domain system now and you could just select the roster for kvk matchmaking i think it'll make it easier but there's a couple of tweaks i would actually make to this and it make it even better right last i saw i could be wrong but the imperium line was around like 19.5 billion power which like compared to three years ago 30 billion it's like really low, right? Like 30 something percent lower, 30 something percent lower, which is crazy. Now, because the Imperium line is so low now, it's affecting uh, a little over a hundred kingdoms. We're like a little over a hundred kingdoms actually have to actively worry about not being Imperium so they can bring in new migrants, right? In my opinion, I think only the top two tiers, right? So Right now, right, I just listen. This is just my opinion. Right, I could be wrong, and, and I really don't know exactly what's going on in every kingdom. But I think we should actually adjust the Imperium line, right? So instead of it, it being the uh, power of the top, the twenty fourth kingdom, you should adjust it where, uh, ideally, only probably about thirty teams are dealing with this. And the reason why I pick thirty is because if you look at uh, American sport, like professional sports, baseball, football, and uh, and basketball, right? there's about 30 professional teams, right? You still have like teams that are perennially a lot better and some that are perennially a lot worse, but there is enough kingdoms or enough uh, teams and enough competitive parity where it actually makes that league very interesting. Whereas right now, the way it is now, right? 1093 has a hard time even getting a match if it's not with 1960 or 2489, right? They keep getting no match found and you just have the same few really high quality kingdoms finding each other over and over again, right? And I think part of it is because when you set the line to 24, 
you're making it a lot harder for a lot of other teams to, to uh, make it up, right? Whereas, uh, let's just say if you set it as a top six, right, which will essentially just cover uh, tier one and tier two, then teams in tier three have an a, a ability to move up, and then maybe teams in tier four or even like tier five uh, can actually worry about building their roster without constantly worry, worrying about the Imperium burden, right? Because right now, Kingdoms are dying, or uh, there's less quality kingdoms left, not because the system is so well and these kingdoms are doing so well. It's actually because the kingdom is essentially like choking off a lot of the quality kingdoms before, and there's just less and less quality kingdoms, right? Uh, the reason why I have 2429, 1365, 1846 listed as a question mark is just because I know uh, all three of those have like downsized uh, recently. So, uh, me personally, I would still consider them that second tier behind 1093, but they could also be part of the third tier. If I had to say where 2268 was, I would say we're kind of in the third tier right now, right? And ideally what it's like is, okay, we should maybe have to worry, we should have to worry about the Imperium burden, but we should be on the outside looking in worrying about the Imperium burden. Whereas tier two should worry about the Imperium burden, but they're on the inside, but they have an opportunity to drop out fairly easily because there's a couple other tier two kingdoms, right? And then with kind of what I said, uh, the first change I would make, even a tier one team like 1093 or uh, 1365, which I think actually has a higher Imperium uh, burden, they also have the opportunity maybe over two or three KVKs to eventually drop out a KVK. So I would actually move the Imperium line to top six. This will actually allow more higher quality kingdoms uh, to build up. And then currently the domain system is 900 spots or 899 spots, right around 900, right? I will actually drop that to 600 spots, right? So out of all these kingdoms I just listed on the screen, uh, 1093 from my understanding has three full alliances and like half or maybe like a four support alliance. So if you just count like uh, 150 per alliance, I know it's, I think it's a little higher, right? They'll add up to about 600, right? Once you start getting into 900, uh, you can start bringing in a lot of farms, but also, um, also, it allows it's it, it almost allows uh, kingdoms to get too big, right? Because if you kind of draw, if you have a imperium line, but then you also set the roster cap to six hundred, even if a lot of players, six hundred players want to, let's say like six hundred and fifty players want to play in a kingdom, well, they can only carry six hundred to a KVK, right? So like there is a cap on how strong they can get. It's almost like a hard cap of how strong they can get, but then also there's a soft cap to still bring it in and kind of push that. Now. Uh, <clears throat> I know in the early game, there's a lot more players. So maybe the 600 spots isn't really uh, appropriate for the early game. So I think uh, maybe start implementing this in KVK5, right? Because by KVK5, at least my experience uh, looking now and then my experience playing, you know, still consider a relatively younger kingdom. By KVK5, we're down to one, one and a half alliance, right? But in KVK3, we had four active alliances. So like, I don't think you should actually use this to limit the amount of people that can play in KVK in the early game. But as you get to the later game, like more of the casual players, the players that just kind of have like a, a distinct shelf life, they kind of weeded themselves out. Uh, for KVK 5 and beyond, uh, I think I would actually move the domain system to 600 spots. This way, if you do bring in 600 active players, you can't bring in any farms, right? And then if you only have one alliance and you bring a lot of farms, your matchmaking will be lower, but the farms will also allow you to at least be a little bit more competitive with uh, the kingdom that brings in 600 players as well. So this is kind of like the change I would make. Okay, so a lot of this is theory crafting. I'm going on like 40 plus minutes now, by far the longest video I've ever made. If you watch all the way to end, thank you so much. Uh, please, please, please leave a comment, uh, right? This is one I think we could have some awesome discussions. If this goes well, I would actually want to present this to Lilith and see maybe uh, if some of these changes are something that they think could really help the game. And again, uh, thank you guys for watching all the way to the end. And I'll talk to you guys next time.